Should I introduce Janan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Everybody, oh, pretty much everybody knows Janan. Anyway, so Janan's from the University of Arizona. And she works in probability and metaphysics and philosophy of science and many other things. And she's going to talk to us about um, why she's only half human. It reminds me of a how, uh, I'm glad you spelled that correctly. You know, Tim Moreland once gave a talk, a lot of people who know this, uh, called Why I'm Not Yumian, but the posters were misprinted. <laughs> but it's short because your spell checker won't, you know, it exists. So. Um, so thank you so much. I'm like super happy to be here. And I feel, I realized that um, I learned almost everything I know about humanism from Barry, so I feel a little bit like an apostate coming back to his views. But, um, but I think it actually, we talked a little bit about it, I think we agreed on most important things. So. Um, so I'm super sorry to read again, feel completely free to just interrupt. That's only the way that I organize my thoughts. Um, so I'm going to be talking about chance, and Barry tells me, although it looks like this isn't quite right, but Barry told me that you're not all philosophers, so it's worth at least sort of saying a few words about the philosophical back backdrop to the discussion. So I'm going to do that. So one of the central questions in the metaphysics of science has always concerned the status of modal notions, so laws, causes, dispositions, capacities. Um, and it was really David Lewis that initiated the philosophical discussion of chance specifically with a, a paper in 1980 that sort of dropped like, um, like a new Drake album or something. And at the time that Lewis was writing, the debate about these notions, about like all of the kind of modal notions connected with science, had settled into two broad classes of view. There was the so-called Humean and the anti-Humean views. The Humean holds, of course, that the world consists of just what happens, um, one thing and then another arranged in a four-dimensional manifold of events, the totality, as he put it, of local matters of particular fact. According to the Humean, the laws and the chances are just patterns in the manifold of events. For the anti-Humean, the ch chances and laws are things that govern and explain those patterns. So in Lewis's eyes, the program of Humean metaphysics, and this is just, again, a bit of the history that tells you why chances sort of got propelled to the forefront of philosophical discussion. Um, the program of Humean metaphysics hinged on the possibility of providing Humean reduction of chances. So what had happened was that he had developed a powerful framework for articulating the difference between Humean and anti-Humean position. Is it blue light? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Let's put the lights on in the back. No, I think it's on. I don't, I don't think there is enough. That's it. Which is better, lights off or on? I think that's on. What? On? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so for the anti-Humean, I actually, what about the middle, the one that you just did? It was just oh, the lights. Oh, that was just, lights. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just Rutgers. <laughs> So for the, um, in Lewis's yeah. eyes, the program hinged on the possibility of providing human um, reduction of chances because he developed this framework for articulating the difference between human and anti-human position, and he provided successful human reductions by his lights and by the lights of many of his followers of laws and causation, but he was really worried about the possibility of a human reduction of chances. Meaning he didn't like it, he didn't want it. He wanted it, he didn't think it could happen. And the reason was that he introduced this principle, the so-called principle principle, that he thought uh, that that sorry, but that he thought provided everything that we know about chance. So it articulated a connection to belief that he thought that we that provided everything that we know at least pre-theoretically a chance about chance. This is what we call the principle principle. And the task for the human, as he saw it, was to find something that supervenes on the collection of local matters of particular fact which could play the role of chance guiding belief articulated by the <coughs> principle principle, or expressed by the principle principle. And the problem was that he thought it couldn't be done. And the reason was laid out in a quite lovely paper. I'm not going to go over the argument, um, but that was what the 1980 paper was about. But what it did was that meant that, that chance becomes the thing on which human program hinges. 
Lewis formulates the, the problem precisely, and suddenly every metaphysician sort of at the time is focused on chance. So, uh, yeah. I'm trying to understand the first bullet point. The uh, is, am I supposed to understand this to mean that the um, what Lewis believed was that what we know about chance, okay, I guess the chance is kind of defined in terms of our credences? Or? No, so, well, it's implicitly defined, which meant yeah. it, it, whatever chance is, it has to satisfy that principle, right? So this principle is supposed to establish a connection to belief, right? and then we're going to use that connection to belief to pick out the thing in the world that is the chance, because it's going to be that thing, whatever it is, that's how, that, you know, that has that connection to belief. So the connection to belief was that if you know what the chance is, I'll say it in a minute, I'll write it. I, yeah, here it is. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right? So, so the idea was, so not everybody agrees anymore that this expresses everything we know about chance, but most people think that whatever chance is, it ought to be the thing that can play that role in guiding belief. Okay. And it's not an accident, of course, that Lewis was focused on objective single case probabilities. At the same time that Lewis was writing, physicists were still struggling to assimilate quantum mechanics. The possibilities for eliminating probabilities in favor of some kind of hidden variable account were, were you know, being made precise, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the objective single prob case probabilities extracted from the wave function by applications of the Born's rule were sort of here to stay. Unlike the other iterations of probability into physics, it was becoming increasingly clear that these were fundamental and ineliminable and something that metaphysicians ought to be paying attention to. So the first thing to say, though, if one looks at the literature now, is that people use the term chance in a bewildering sort of variety of ways. So sometimes they use it following Lewis, and Lewis was, was very explicit about this, to refer specifically to the objective single case probabilities that guide credence in accordance with the principal principle. And this used to be the standard practice in philosophy, um, partly because of Lewis's influences, but as, as the discussion of, of chance widened beyond the relatively narrow niche of Lewis's metaphysics to include discussions in quantum foundations and work in statistical mechanics, um, that usage became less uniform and it got corrupted to some extent. So sometimes it, the term chance is used nowadays, if you look at the literature, to refer to any form of objective probability. And sometimes it's simply unclear what's being talked about. So when I say chance, and this is just a stipulative terminological stipulation, um, I will talk about other forms of probability as well, but just so that we know kind of analytically um, what we're focused on. I'm going to follow the Lewisian tradition and mean the objective single case probabilities related to credence by a principal principle like principles, about which I'm going to say more in a second. And extracted from the wave function by applications of Born. And this is not because I think chance in that sense is any more objective or any more fundamental. Right now that's just to have clearly in focus again what we're talking about. Um, and it's worth mentioning uh, something that many of you are probably much more aware of than even I am these days, that there's been a lot of dispute about the correct form of the principle principle. Again, for my purposes, that won't matter here. There's a lot of different closely related principles um, that one wants to think of as, that are proposed as capturing the role of chance in guiding credence. So there's the principal principle, there's the new principle of Ned Hall, there's a principle that I've defended um, called the generalized principle principle. But they, they coincide in the core cases that form the everyday reasoning about chances, and that's all that's going to matter here. So it doesn't matter which of those principles you like. I'm not going to make use of any of the differences between them. And again, we're going to follow Lewis using the principal principle as an implicit definition of chances, using the link to credences, that is to say, to pick out the object of analytic attention. Chance is that thing such that when you know it, and you have no and, and this is a crucial clause in the principal principle, and you have no specific information from the future, you adopt it as credence, and that's true no matter what other information you have. And this is not an explicit definition. 
and we and we don't have to agree with Lewis that it captures everything we know about chance. But whatever chance that ends up being, it has to make sense that in a world like ours, it plays this role in capture in, in guiding credence, the role captured in guiding the role guiding credence captured by a principle, principle like principle. So when I say that the chances are single case probabilities, by that I mean to distinguish them from general probabilities. General probabilities, like for example, the probability that a system in state S at time T1 evolves into a state, into, um, a state S prime at T2, pertain to classes, and the basic form is conditional. Single case probabilities, so for example, the probability that this particular system, which happens to be in a state S prime, will evolve into a state, in, in state S, will evolve into state S prime, over some specified interval. Right? Pertain to individual events, and the basic form is unconditional. So there's a rather intricate collection of technical and philosophical debates that's sort of grown up around the discussion of chances since Lewis wrote, um, since Lewis's early papers, including some of his own. And I'm just going to just, I'm not going to do anything like try to give you a comprehensive overview. I'm not even going to engage the arguments in much detail. What I'm going to try to do is just distill out the ones that I take the most seriously and then try to motivate my own kind of movement from being a dyed in the wool human to something a little bit more qualified. So, for those of you who know it, I took the title of my paper from Yuda Pearl's sort of wonderful Bayesian. Bayesianism and causality, or as he says, why I am only a half Bayesian. Um, so in that paper, what Pearl does is he tries to kind of relate how someone that starts as a Bayesian might be led away from the view in its pure, pure form. And like Pearl, that's what I'm going to do. I come from a human place. Um, I was brought up human. I have a human heart. <laughs> but I see good reasons for moving away a little bit, at least from the orthodox view of humanism. And I'm going to try to, what I'm going to do is try to defend a sort of half human view that retains the ontological thesis that characterizes humanism. <clears throat> but it denies that the human account does or should provide a content preserving reduction of chance, chance statements to statements about non chance effects. So, philosophical motivation for human is the standard and metaphysical vision of the world combined with a view about the epistemic role that beliefs about chances play. I think you know, there are differences among humans about which of these has priority. So for Lewis, and I think for Barry, um, or maybe not, but certainly for Lewis and for a lot of people writing this literature, the metaphysical vision comes first. But for some contemporary humans, and I think I would include myself, people like Richard Healy, Carl Heffer, Hugh Price, it's really the epistemic role that comes first. So here's David Albert giving voice to the human view. On the human view, the world considered as a whole is merely, purely there. It isn't the sort of thing that's susceptible of being explained or accounted for or traced back to something else. There isn't anything that it obeys. There's nothing to talk about over and above the totality of concrete particular facts. There's a statement of the metaphysical vision. And science is in the business of producing the most compact and informative possible summary of that totality. There's the epistemic view about the role of chance. So the canonical form of the Humean view is given by the best systems analysis. And I'm sorry again if this is all stuff that everybody is kind of knows really well. I hope it's helpful to at least some of you. Um, in, on best system analysis, laws and chances come in packages, best systems that are chosen on the basis of simplicity, strength, and best overall fit with the human mosaic. Lots of discussion about exactly how to explicitly characterize those things. Beliefs about laws and chances are products of the systematization of information about the human mosaic. The patterns in the human mosaic that provide the basis for choice between different systems are then presented, and this is a sort of a crucial part of the view, presented as truth makers for uh, chance and law assertions. So on this view, statements about chance just are compact summaries of information about the distributed patterns in the manifold of events. 
And the function of this kind of compact summary is to provide limited creatures like us, creatures that is, who don't have any specific information about the future, with information that will guide action and belief in a world that's sort of too complex to be sort of fully comprehended in a description um, that we could grasp. So there is, of course, that this is I mean, more of a schema than anything else. There's a lot of room under the human umbrella for different accounts of what makes a system a good one, and whether there is a single system, and various things one can raise questions about, whether there's a single system for all the science or many systems, one for each special science. The human product can be really thought, the human project, sorry, can be really thought of as a schema to be completed by filling in an explicit account of how systematizations are chosen, how they're individuated, and there's a lot of flexibility in an, ex, in an explicit account, or, sorry, flexibility in the metaphysical vision. So few contemporary humans want to legislate what fundamental ontology looks like. So remember for Lewis, he started out with a metaphysical um, vision. The world consists of the totality of local mass of particular fact, and he had a very particular view about what those looked like. Um, it's clearer now than it was for Lewis that it's not likely that the fundamental metaphysics will take the form of his local matters of particular separable spatio-temporally local facts. But so long as fundamental structures, whatever they are, support an effective theory that looks more or less like the human mosaic above the Planck scale, then any successful reduction of chances to the human mosaic will be supported by whatever substructure supports the, um, the human mosaic. So maybe once physics is settled on a fundamental ontology, we, we will want to frame human reductions directly in those terms. But for now, at least, it's not clear that there's some principled obstacle to the sort of two-step procedure. What's the two-step? Reduce chances to, fun to the human mosaic, and then let, the, let, let whatever the fundamental ontology ends up being sort of generate a kind of emergent effective theory that looks more or less like the human mosaic. You don't look happy about that. Maybe I wasn't listening closely enough. I, I thought the human mosaic, mosaic was all there was. But For Lewis, it was. So the suggestion is, yeah, but not a bit. So the Lewisian vision is the world consists of local, the, the totality of local matters, a particular separable fact arranged in a spatio temporal manifold. If one worries, so one of the objections that one might make to the whole Lewisian project is, Physic, the, the fundamental physical ontology is not likely to take that form. So then the question is, does that throw the whole human project out the window? And the response to that is, well, it's not obvious that it should. If we can give a reduction of uh, chances to the human mosaic, and then show that the human mosaic is a kind of effective theory, which means that those are structures that stabilize out of whatever the fundamental ontology is at a certain level of description, then any reduction to the human mosaic will be supported by whatever substructure supports the human mosaic. Yeah? Um, if, if you think there's a substructure beneath the human mosaic, uh, you might want to uh, start reducing things that were previously reduced to the human, human mosaic directly to that substructure. So is there some particular reason why people are thinking we ought to still go via the human mosaic? Yeah, no, so this was the point about if we knew what that substructure was, okay. <laughs> then we might try to frame human reductions in those terms, but I right see. now we don't have the substructure, right? I so, see. I mean, I think what, what happens in physics is, of course, we penetrate in layers. We start somewhere mid-level, and we work our way down, you know, looking, like sort of yeah, coming to understand one level and then looking deeper. <clears throat> the thing that gets it filled in last is the bottom layer. But that's not generally, and, it's, and, and the hope is that it's not, in this case, um, a barrier to looking for human reductions, because so long as we can reduce it to a lower, layer, lower level that's in turn supported by whatever's underneath, then, um, then that's at least a working start. So is it possible we could have different chances at different levels of description? Did you have something in mind? Um, so, oh, well, yes, in one, one obvious sense, yes, because the, the um, classical level, the effectively classical level, is effectively deterministic, so all of the chances are zero or one. 
we look a little bit underneath that, we have quantum mechanics, in which case we have non-trivial chances or microscopic events. But I don't think what is the case is that we're going to get conflicting chances, or we shouldn't, otherwise we've got a problem. So conflicting chances are the same then. Because there are people who think that, do think that you get different probabilities by applying a Lewis-like idea with different languages. What did you have in mind? Well, Craig, Craig and... Um, Right, so, but that, I think that's not, do they think you, you get non-trivial chances that are unequal for the same event when phrased in the same language? Because I no, think it events. Phrased in different languages. Yeah. But the, but the trouble is that they'll end up conflicting because the higher level language will ultimately be whatever makes, there'll be some fundamental facts which make any sense in the higher level. Oh, that's right. Um, fact, true or false. So, so right. they do run into this worry about whether or not they, about the possibility of these conflicts, about which they don't say anything. Yeah, and it has the shape of a kind of reference class problem, right? right. Because you've got a fundamental level that's generating general probabilities, and you've got chances that, are, that you can class in different reference classes. Yeah, that's right. But it oughtn't to be that fundamental chances are, in any sense, conflict. Right. So, and, right. so in the actual world, there's going to be emergent classicality of areas on the planet motion and so on. And they don't really have trivial chances of zero or one, I guess. If you think that both money and social mechanics is a pretty good guide to think about chances of classical mechanics, they have natural chances of trajectories of various planets or even uh, ice melting in, uh, in the water and so on that could potentially conflict with quantum mechanics. We know they don't, but that's because of detailed analysis of how classical systematic emerges from quantum standpoint. Yeah. The reason it's worthwhile checking that they don't, right. so it's not as a conceptual matter that they're not going to conflict, but as a physical matter, they ought to be consistent. Right. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, social scientists that are working very hard to try to understand the structure of our society and whether certain social programs work or what the chances are they work. And they think they're talking about objective probabilities. Uh, but Clearly, they're doing a certain level of description that is very dependent upon our particular culture. And at some deeper level, these wouldn't be objective probabilities. Is this a is this practical kind of statistical issue in this picture at all? Not yet. Yes. No, but it ought to be. So here's again, you know, one of the reasons that I carved out a very specific sort of objective analytic attention is because there's lots of there's lots of really interesting issues uh, around here. So, I mean, one of the pictures that one might have, and probably the picture I have, is there's objective probabilities everywhere. You know, fix a, fix a reference class and ask about, you know, fix a reference class, fix some constraints, choose some property, and under the right conditions where there's stabilized relative frequencies, you can start talking about probabilities. People in, gen in physics, at least, in the physics community thought for a long time, yeah, but those are epistemic, or they're in some sense not a fundamental feature of the physical world. They ought to emerge in some sense from the dynamics operating on, on um, whatever the fundamental ontology is. I'm not endorsing that. It's not my view, but it's what people thought for a long time. The reason that the chances became kind of the object of attention, because they looked very different. They were fundamental. They looked ineliminable. And people started talking about them in the context of a discussion which they hadn't talked about them before. I think my own view is, but that I'm not. So you think? So you tell me Lewis was motivated by quantum mechanics. He was he for got... sure motivated by wanting to, by so, wanting his his ontology to be. So the... well, let me finish though, because there's a qualification to that. He was for sure wanting his ontology to be classical, but um, he wasn't. And, and this is I'm using his words. He wasn't willing yet to take lessons from quantum mechanics. Um, about what the fundamental ontology was. So he thought we needed an interpretation of chances, but you know, if you look at what his fundamental ontology is, it doesn't look very quantum mechanical because it's local matters are particular, but, separable, spatiotemporal. But there is a funny conflict in him because on the one hand, he didn't want to be motivated by quantum mechanics to talk about the fundamental ontology. Yeah. On the other hand, his classical mechanics is deterministic and he didn't think there were any, what he called chances, in yeah. determining if the fundamental laws were deterministic. 
So yeah, I yeah. pulled in two different directions. Right. So, but I guess my question is, all the all the objective probabilities are being talked about in ten thousand different academic fields outside of physics would not be ch none of them are chances in his picture. Is that correct? Is that in his I picture, right? Nice. Exactly right. Um, I'll, I'll say something. I know you're dissatisfied, and I'll say something um, about the general probabilities in a minute. But for sure, that's what it was. He was a metaphysician. He wanted to know what the fundamental structure of the world was. And so it was only chances that seemed to claim his attention, at least at this stage. In fact, his early paper was called. So the word chances was around and used a lot before David Lewis. Right. Uh, so you're telling me that now the, all of philosophy has been. Uh, it wasn't just Lewis, though. <laughs> Hopper used the word exactly the same way. He thought the only objective probabilities there are are chances, these dynamical things. That are, are, but they're only in quantum mechanics? No, Hopper argued that because there are chances elsewhere, that determinism must be false. He wasn't, didn't want to commit the quantum mechanics exactly what you but uh, the, the fundamental dynamical laws were non, yeah. non deterministic Okay. Sorry. I mean, there's a lot of, no, but they're good questions. There's a lot of interesting sociology around this time because, again, there were all these discussions going on in the higher level sciences, you know, that used words like probability and chance and took them to be perfectly objective. Um, it's only when they, they appeared in, you know, kind of, fundamental physics that metaphysicians started paying attention. When metaphys metaphysicians started paying attention, it just happened that Lewis wrote this paper that made kind of enormous issues in metaphysics hinge on well, understanding. Well, weren't metaphysicians paying attention to this in the 19th century? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sure some of them are. I just, yeah. it's sort of, I don't know if they did any. Yeah, any, so they. Did the metaphysician in the 19th century have an interest in probability? I'm trying to think, actually. Um, what are you thinking about? Popper, for sure. He's not in the 19th the, century, though. He might many. seem to us now to be. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Okay, so I, I got nothing. <laughs> that, that's as far back as my history goes. <laughs> Sorry. So you I mean, see that we need I a mean, bit of an education I, in the I, history I, of probability. Okay, Ian Hacking wrote this great yeah. book about the history of statistics, but I don't know how he used the word chance. But this is just, you know, it filtered in the, d the discussion of chance and filtered into a certain part of philosophy through Lewis's discussions. Um, and they, f they just happened to filter into this in this well, particular form. That's just let me claim that the, the people who have founded the journal Mind, for example, were talking about these issues in the 19th century. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> completely happy to believe that, yeah. Um, so sorry for doing any violence to the history, um, but this is certainly, I mean, you know, this was the discussion that was formative, you know, for a long time, and that I think uh, there's a, you know, that, that was formative in terms of a, a strand in the philosophical discussion that started around. Barry reminded me that our friend um, uh, Princeton, uh, Best Systems, uh, my former neighbor, uh, who said that uh, for philosophy should not have any history more than 10 years old. Gil Harmon. Gil Harmon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, feels like it's in that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I said I started in the 19, in 1980. I'm okay. just describing okay. a particular. Okay. Okay. I'm not giving you okay. the history of probability by any measure. Um, but, I, but it's probably true that you know many of the people involved in this discussion had as yeah. ecliptic a vision of history as I do. Um, <laughs> Okay, so what was I? Okay, so the reasons to like humanism um, are pretty clear. It does a good job of capturing the function of scientific theories to systematize information about the human mosaic in a compact form for use by limited agents. It achieves a good match between the function of the scientific theory and the standards by which theories are judged. Simplicity, strength, and fit make good sense as standards by which theories um, are judged against one another if the goal is to systematize information about the human mosaic in a compact form that's usable by agents. 
um, who know something about the past and have no specific information about the future. And it doesn't come with weird old metaphysical commitments like connections between universals or any of the various things that anti-humans have actually proposed as additions to the mosaic. Against this, though, anti-humans say that the human account robs the chances of explanatory power. They hold, they hold that the chances are a substantial ontological posit, needed in the explanation of why there's, there are stabilized relative frequencies. The argument here parallels the argument for believing in anti-human laws. The claim is that without laws, a substantial ontological posit. There is no explanation for all the irregularity in the world. What keeps planets in orbit and airplanes in the air? Or airplanes from falling out of the sky? This is speaking in an anti-human voice, if not the laws, then what? And similarly, what keeps casinos in business and um, insurance companies from making money? So say anti-humans, if not the chances, then what? And I think this is really the heart of the dispute between humans and anti-humans. And there's a lot to say here. I mean, since Lewis wrote, the discussion has mostly followed the framing that Lewis gave it, with humans on the one side and anti-humans on the other, and chance treated as one of the class of structures that should get uniform treatment. So mo most people are humans or anti-humans. But it might be another sign of the way that the discussion is maturing that I think there are more and more people now defending a more selective kind of humanism, which makes the considerations in favor of humanism a cha about chance have to do with particular features of chances rather than just a generalized skepticism about modality. And that changes the discussion to some extent. So Carl Hepper, for example, is a human about chance and a non-human about laws. Another anti-human argument contends that the best systems analysis is the development of an old tradition that tries to reduce probabilities to frequencies and holds that it suffers from the same problems that the simpler accounts in that tradition suffer from. So the frequency theorist says that the probabilities would be identified with frequencies that satisfy some criteria, criterion, so let's just call these the C frequencies. The anti-reductionist points out that the law of large numbers assigns a non-zero probability to the possibility that the C frequencies diverge from the probabilities. And that seems to be true no matter what one fills in for C and it presents an obstacle to any strict identity between beliefs about chance and beliefs with frequencies of any kind. So the holistic reduction of chance plus law packages to patterns in the human mosaic, which is what the best systems analysis effectively does, makes it hard to apply the law of large numbers directly, but, but it actually, I think, suffers from a version of the same problem. So if we look at the modal implications of accepting a best system, say, let's call it B, we will find ourselves committed to the possibility of worlds in which the laws and chances aren't given by the best system in that world. So for example, consider a simple world W, which, considers a, which consists of a sequence, of, a very large sequence of flips of, um, of a coin, roughly half of which come up heads and half of which come up tails in a pattern that doesn't admit of any compression. And suppose that the best systematization, B, of the results of the flips at W, assigns 50% chance um, to heads on any given toss. But of course, B has a model in which every toss, in fact, comes up heads. And the best systematizations of the fact at that world would assign 100% chance to heads. So from the point of view of B, of course, that's just a lucky accident. It's a, it's a lucky possibility that B itself allows for. A possibility that's explicitly recognized by B. And indeed, any best system, that is any package of laws and chances that systematizes the facts of a world of com any kind of complexity, of, of complexity at all comparable to ours, is almost certainly going to have models in which nothing of much of interest happens and which permitted a simpler systematization. So just as the very logic of probabilistic belief, as expressed by the law of large numbers, explicitly recognizes an ineliminable modal gap between probabilities and frequencies of any kind that can be explicitly characterized by a criterion C, it seems like the logic of best systems 
makes room for the possibility of worlds in which the laws and the chances are not given by the best system of that world. So take any pattern of fact, and it will be a model of indefinitely many different theories with different chance plus law packages. Take any chance plus law package, and we can see that it's compatible with any number of radically different, uh, different patterns of fact, some of which permit of a simpler systematization. These are clearly conceived worlds in which both the pattern of fact and the probabilities, or sorry, the distribution of chances are well defined, and again, these, these possibilities provided, by, provided for by the very logic of accepting the best system. So why is this a problem? Because, I'm going to say in a second. It's a problem because if the standards by which you judge a reduction are that you oughtn't to be able to conceive a world, if you say that A is identical to B, then you oughtn't to be able to conceive a world in which A is the case and B isn't the case, or in which B is the case and A isn't the case, then the reduction has failed. So if you can hold fix the facts, and you can vary the distribution of chances, the claim is that, that by our ordinary standards for judging reductions, the chances can't simply be patterns in the manifold of facts. So, but are the chances being varied here? I thought the outcomes are being varied. Why? The chances are being varied. Because on the best systems analysis, the chances are given by the best systematization. Yeah, of, of the actual world. At, the chances at a world are given by the best systematization at that world. But we only have to do that for our own world. We don't have to do that for some other world. Good point. Right. Okay. Let's take this up again at the end because I think Barry thinks something like this. He'll, um, and I'm, I, I'd like to talk about it more, but maybe let me sort of go on and then we can come back to it. So the claim is, at least, that you're committed to the possibility of worlds in which the chances vary independently of, of the best systematization of that world. So accepting a best system as authoritative about the chances themselves seems to undermine an identity between chances and patterns and the manifold of fact. OK, not everybody is persuaded by this argument. I know that. I find it persuasive. Um, but I don't think that it shows that there's something wrong with the Humean ontology. I think that what it really does show is that beliefs about chances are different from beliefs about patterns in the manifold of fact, but that the Humean can embrace this. The epistemic heart of Humeanism is an account of how beliefs about chance and laws and causes and dispositions and all of the other sort of modal outputs of, of theorizing are generated by the process of theorizing. And the human should just say that as a result of systematization, our concepts become articulated enough to allow us to conceive of worlds in which the chances float free of the categorical facts. So long as you can tell a story about how concepts become articulated without reifying the chances, that right by reifying the chances, I mean by sort of recognizing you know, primitive mode properties in the world, then this won't lead to an anti-human ontology. So you don't want to reify chances? Don't want to reify chances. Well, you want to have beliefs about chances. I want to have beliefs about chances. I want to hold that beliefs about chances aren't exactly the same thing but as you, don't have this. If you haven't reified something, how do you have a belief about it? So this is a huge, let, so let me sketch the story. Okay, okay. Um, and, then, and then we can talk a little bit more about the general kind of semantics and metaphysical picture behind it. But that's that's absolutely the heart of it. Yeah. Uh, is this kind of like a phenomenal concepts way of defending physicalism? Is it that kind of thought that maybe it seems like we can conceive zombies, but that's a fact about our concept, so we don't need to kind of reify consciousness to account for it? It's, it's a denial. Kind of so that would be an instance of it. It's a denial. Okay, so a couple of things to say. Just is first of all, I think the primary thing for me is to understand how we form beliefs about chances, and then I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. How we form beliefs about chances, without sort of positing anything like you know, <coughs> beliefs about chances don't depend on 
the substantial pre-existing kind of existence of chances in the same way that beliefs about cows depend on that and commit you to that. So I'm primarily interested in first preserving, an, uh, preserving the idea that beliefs about, the contents of beliefs about chances are different than you know, um, simply beliefs about patterns in the manifold of fact. They have modal commitments that ordinary beliefs about patterns of the modal of uh, patterns in the in the mosaic of categorical fact don't have, and that's exhibited clearly by the fact that we can clearly conceive of worlds in which you know the the um, the chances come apart from from um, uh, the best systematization of fact at that world. What does that show? I don't think it shows that there are things in the world called chances in a substantial ontological sense. So then, that, that's the primary, primary thing for me. But then people will want to say, okay, so what's the semantics? So there's a generalized picture of semantics that, and I'm not gonna argue for this here, but it's definitely something that I think is the right view, but, but that, that one isn't committed whenever one uses a word to kind of a representational story about that world. When you understand what the chances are, and when you understand what beliefs about the chances do, right, you understand that you're not committed to their being. So, so Ezra's suggestion is an interesting one, but really different from yours. So he was suggesting, is, or he was asking, is it like the idea that the, there's the concept of chance and the concept of whatever the, the human facts are, um, don't have commitments to each, each other there somehow, so that one of them has a commitment to, to modal commitments and the other one, that the other one doesn't, while in fact they refer to the same reality or the same properties. That's the phenomenal concept strategy. But your view is that in fact this, the semantics is going to be different for the two concepts. It's deflationary. I mean, depend, so this is, again, this is kind of part of a broader picture that I, I don't think much I say hinges on. So whatever you want to say about semantics, I don't care that much. I want to get the story of how we form, you know, how we form chance beliefs, what they do for us, and why they don't depend on there being something outside, you know, that. So it sounds but, like but, wait, let me finish it. But, what, but, but I think I'm a defla total deflationist about this. I think we get concepts, they're wrapped up in an inferential network. The content of the concepts, in one sense, is given by their role in the inferential network. It's not the case that every, and we need a notion of content that's finely enough individuated so that things that aren't intersubstitutable, sal you know, salva veritate, in the inferential network, yes. Oughtn't to be, oughtn't to have the same content. So the semantics does play a role, because you won't accept the semantics in which the references of the of the chance concept and some some purely human concept is exactly the same. Well, so I was going to say there's another notion of content. So I want right. that notion of content, very finely individuated, finely individuated enough to distinguish chance beliefs from from beliefs about patterns in the mind of the fact. But I also want to hold on to this idea that we can, you know, that there are external, so that's a purely internal notion of content, individuated by internal role. I want to hang on to the idea. I think we have a, uh, you know, a need for it when you're, when you're doing, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, wor word world mapping to look for, you know, how it is that that beliefs in the head are guided by things outside the head. So I think, you know, that, the reason I'm resisting these questions is because those questions seem to force you into a package of commitments about whenever you think that there's one of these finely individuated, you know, more finely individual, where, where you can find distinctions at the level of belief, you're committed to there being distinctions at the level of the world. I'm just going to deny that. But I'm going to deny that less, less, you know, because I'm a semanticist and I'm primarily into, but I just don't think it's right about the chances. So I think you know the best support I can give is just to let me tell the story about the chances, and then you can say what you want about the, the semantics. I'm going to refuse to be committed to something outside the head, but I'm going to continue wanting to use that in, in what I take to be an entirely realistic way. That's what it is to be committed to the chances. To have beliefs that are guided in the right way by things in the environment, but without reifying and you know chances as substantial ontological. Okay. Um, so the, about this argument, this convinced me that you know I, I I get it that it doesn't convince everyone. It does convince. It did convince me that at the level of, of content, 
one needs something more finely individuated than one can find in the environment. That beliefs about chance aren't the same thing as beliefs about systematized, you know, pat pattern specs. I can believe that that a certain pattern um, it, it, uh, exists in the human mosaic and still reject that the chances. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how different this is from the way you're looking at it, but. But in an alternative to be simultaneously a reductionist about chance and a reductionist about the possibilities. I mean, if you thought if the mosaic is this way, yeah. then that gives us a space of worlds in which, and simultaneously with the um, uh, conception of what count as the chances within those worlds. Yeah. I mean, the conflict only comes if you think you have a space of worlds sort of fixed from the start, and then within each world you have your way of re reading off given the best system account of what the chances are in that world. Because then you get the problem, well, in our world, we predict other worlds, and then if you just run the best systems account in those other worlds, you get the wrong results. Right. But if you um, didn't think of the space of worlds as being fixed from the start, I'm not sure, maybe this is a little too easy. Uh, Accepting the moral commitments of a systematization seems to give you the space of the world. So even if you don't think of them as fixed from the start, as soon as you accept a theory, it gives you the space of worlds, and among those are going to be ones, you know, it's a product of the systematization that you're committed to the existence of worlds in which the chances are given by something other than the systematization. I, 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 let me write. Uh, yeah. Let me think about that. Okay, yeah, that'd be super helpful. Um, thank you. But this wasn't the main part of the talk, so I'm just going to go on. Um, so what I'm going to do in the rest of the paper <laughs> is going to propose a kind of direction which I think the human view should be developed. And as I said, the semantic story is less important to me than just the detail of you know, what, what chance beliefs do, how we form beliefs about them, and preserving a distinction between you know, sort of the content of beliefs about chance and the content of claims about patterns in the human mosaic. I guess, I mean, there's a more, sorry, I'm going back to it now, but I, the more general thing is it would be nice to, and this is what I think, it would be nice to sort of grant that our beliefs are modal through and through, but the world isn't modal through and through. In the remainder of the paper, so I'm going to propose a direction in which the human view should be felt, and the suggestion is going to be, again, that we accept the modal commitments of accepting a best system but give an account of them that understands them purely in terms of their epistemic role. So to pave the way for that, an adjustment I think has to be made to the Humean program. These are all, the pictures are all from my garden. Um, I didn't take them. The strategy for Humean and anti -hum the anti-Humean alike has been for the most part up until now to sort of attack the question of what chances are directly. So since chances appear alongside laws in our fundamental theories, the presumption has been that they're the most fundamental form of objective probability. And the task has been conceived as a matter of kind of sorting out the connection between the chances and the categorical facts directly, while imposing a connection to credence captured by the principal principle or one of its sort of variants as a constraint. If we situate chances in a more complex matrix of probabilistic notions, I think we get a more nuanced understanding of how chances relate to the categorical facts, and then that paves the way for the kind of half human view I want to propose. So this is where I think your input would be super helpful. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to do now. What follows is really condensed, but um, but hopefully you'll see clearly enough what the outlines of the view are. So probability measure is a function that maps events in sample space to real numbers in such a way that it satisfies probability axioms. So again, recall the distinction between general and single case probabilities. General probabilities, I said, pertain to classes and the basic form is conditional. Single case probabilities, so the, the probability that a particular carrier of the BRAC2 gene will develop cancer pertain to individual events, and the basic form is unconditional. Yeah, uh, I think Isaac might have this similar Isaac. question, but I, I was wondering how you're thinking of events, 
and just if you can say more about the distinction between general and single case, I'm wondering if it's really a distinction in kind or if it's more like a distinction of degree. Oh, uh, so I'll say what I think, and then okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you what you had in mind. So, I mean, this, the simplest case that I'm thinking uh, of is to think about um, uh, quantum mechanics. So, you know, the Born's rule tells you get a system in a certain state has a probability of p of, of um, if a system is in a certain state, it has a probability of v of transit p of transitioning to some other state at some later time, or a system in a certain state has probability p of showing you know, a certain result under me in measurement. So that's a general probability, because it says if a system of a certain kind in a certain state is subjected to a certain kind of interaction, then it has a probability. So it pertains to classes of, class of all systems that fall in that class. Um, but in but, but particular instances, of what is the chance of getting an up result in a spin measurement in x direction on this particle? Unconditional, single case. Did you? Um, yeah. I think I just have a hard time getting a grip on single case probabilities. But I think, so I guess I'm thinking that by pointing to a particle and saying, I'm measuring this particle, I guess I'm kind of thinking that you're implicitly conditionalizing on the relevant properties of that particle. Yeah, yeah. so far this is just a po point about that I'm going to talk about. Yeah, I'm going to say, say how to relate general case. But again, I'm starting from a discussion where Lewis said there are single case probabilities of the kind you fill in for the principal principle, and they, they um, guide your credence. Single case objective. So probably what I'm doing is saying, let's get a little bit more articulated about where those single case probabilities come from. Okay. Um, So general probabilities are related to single case probabilities by the principle that the single case probability of an x that is randomly selected from a population of y's is the general probability of x given y. These definitions then license an inference from a general probability to a single case probability where the selection procedure is random and where nothing else is known that might affect the probability. So for example, and it's okay if these are rough and schematic. I'm just trying to chart out generally the relationships as a, as, a, as a first pass. So for example, the general probability that a person will develop cancer, given that they carry the BRAC2 gene, is 0.45. Then the single case probability that a particular carrier of that gene, about which you have no more specific information, will develop cancer is Keteris Paribus, 0.45. So it's statistical probabilities, then, are general probabilities. What makes them probabilities is that they obey the probability axioms. What makes them statistical is a connection to statistics. The connection to statistics comes from the law of large numbers in its weaker, strong versions, which says that the relative frequency of, a, of x in a class of randomly selected y's approaches is OK. So in operational terms, statistical probabilities are elements in a theoretical matrix that mediate inference from observed statistics to local samples to others in this, from observed statistics in local samples to others in the same class, probabilistic notions are connected to actual observed frequencies by the body of operational procedures and norms by which we infer probabilities from collected statistics. Those operational procedures are embodied in the canons of statistical inference. They're largely tacit. I'm not, I don't think you get any, anything closer than that in the way of an explicit connection, an explicitly specifiable connection. Assignment of statistical probabilities commits one to the expectation that statistics for one sample, and this is a claim about what you're committed to in accepting a probability statement, commits one to the expectation that the statistics for one sample will reflect those of others, provided that no selection was exercised, either in the collection of the sample or the target class. That is the one that we're forming expectations about. And then the expectation grows as the size of the sample incre increases and is defeasible by the belief that the selection was biased or that the selection process was not random. And again here I'm just taking myself to sort of articulate some of the norms that guide statistical inference and the commitments that come from accepting a probability statement. Statistical probabilities, and again what I'm doing is just 
teasing out different notions of probability and trying to relate them to one another. Statistical probabilities contrast with epistemic probabilities, where statistical probabilities are interpreted by a connection to frequencies. Epistemic probabilities are interpreted by a connection to belief. What makes them probabilities is, again, that they satisfy, that they obey the probability axioms. What makes them epistemic is the connection to belief. There's a descriptive form of epistemic probabilities. That's what the credences are. They represent the epistemic states or degrees of belief of agents. Then the principal principle, recall, is introduced by Lewis as an expression of the role that chance plays by <coughs> belief. His informal statement of the connection to belief was, if you know what the chance, that the chance of E, an event E, a particular event E is X, and you don't have a crystal ball, ball or any form, any other form of supernatural in, information from the future, your credence in E should be X. The principal principle tells us effectively how chance is situated in this matrix of probabilistic notions. It tells us that the chances are a normative form of epistemic probability. And it tells us that the chances are adopted as credence in the absence of information from the future. That's just built into the principle. So now the question is, how do we connect this matrix, this whole matrix of probabilistic notions, and I gave you some principles about how they're connected to one another, how do we connect them to the categorical facts? Well, we begin with the most direct point of contact, the general statistical probabilities associated with stabilized relative frequencies across, cla across classes of the kind that casinos and lotteries and insurance companies and so on rely on. These kinds of probabilities are defined for types rather than tokens, and the basic form is conditional. They exist in deterministic as well as indeterministic contexts. We have a probability for A given B when we have a relative frequency of A's among B's with the right kind of stability, and I take it that this is what von Mises was talking about, where the frequency is roughly stable across not carefully chosen subselections from the B's. We have good philosophical models for how these kinds of probability, for these kinds of probabilities in specific cases. So the, the one that I know best, and I think the one that people talk about in the philosophical literature, is the diaconis model of coin flip. So the dynamical underpinnings, but the dynamical underpinnings for these kinds of probabilities will vary from case to case. And the knowledge that there is a probability associated with the event in some reference class, a relative frequency with the right kind of microstructure, often precedes our explicit understanding of the dynamical underpinnings. So very often we have experimentally accessible um, probabilities of this kind, and it takes a while for the physics to develop a, a detailed understanding of the dynamical underpinnings from which those stabilized relative frequencies emerge. I'm sorry, who, whose model of the coin flip? Diaconis, is that the yeah, right way yeah. to say it? What's this have to do with him? I'm sorry. I know. So the, so the idea is that we get those kinds of stabilized relative frequencies, and we come to understand how they get stabilized out of a microdynamics. Okay, that's in his different model? Cases. So the, at least in the facade, there's a kind of detailed analysis of why coins have, you know, 50-50 chance in terms of within an entirely classical setting in terms of what the microdynamics looks like and why you I can expect the right sort of noise from the environment. I thought his model came up with a chance of a slightly biased. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slight, slight bias. Rough, that's why I said roughly. I meant to say that. Um, So science was neck deep in these kinds of probabilities long before quantum mechanics came on the scene. And probabilistic thinking in everyday life relies on the existence of these kinds of emergent stabilized relative frequencies that let us form reasonable objective expectations where we have only partial knowledge. Um, now, you left quantum mechanics behind, so now. Yep. Um, so are these chances you're talking about now or not? You're not talking about chances now, you're talking about? I'm talking about statistical probabilities. Statistical probabilities, okay. We can sketch a broadly human story about the emergence and use of probabilistic thinking. 
for these kinds of probabilities. Humans think that there are physical systems, and they think that physical systems have categorical properties. They think that there are laws that determine physically allowable trajectories. So far, as, so far there's nothing probability-like in what I said. There's a large body of work that shows how to sort of introduce general conditional probabilities of the form probability of A given B, where we have stabilized relative frequencies that support projection to new random subselections from a relevant class. These generalized conditional probabilities don't yet have the right form to play the role of uh, the role guiding belief characterized by the principal principle, precisely because they're general and they're conditional, the principal principle requ recall requires something that's both single case and unconditional. I guess I'm um, all along I haven't quite got to this conditional, unconditional thing. The single case is conditional on the situation you're in, right? So why is it unconditional? It's unconditional in form. And then the question is, how do we find the right? How do we find the numbers that 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 can play that role? And part of the backstory here is by looking at these general conditional probabilities and see which one has the right form to play the epistemic role, or the right uh, the has the right quantitative um, characteristics to play the epistemic role in chat uh, of the of chance in the principle. So think of it as a Why are you calling the general statistical probabilities conditional? Because they're relative to reference classes. So that's they're not why conditional on that reference class. The probability, OK, so help me here. This uh, is what I was thinking. The probability of p, given that, it's uh, uh, the probability of uh, a, a person having um, developing cancer in the next 10 years um, given that they, they carry the, the BRAC2 gene is the sort of conditional probability I have in mind. Okay. So it so, tells you the, so the you incidence know, of cancer in reference If you have a lottery and you, if you, you, you mentioned lotteries up there. So Where do I mention them? In the first bullet. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about conditional probability. It's conditional on being from that lottery? Is that what you mean? The conditions that define the lottery, there's a single, I, maybe lotteries isn't the best. Casinos might be a better example. But lotteries, yeah, the probability of, casino, given that there's a single. Conditional on that insurance company? No, so, uh, okay. Yeah, you, I mean, you can always, make, is, you can always represent um, single case probabilities as conditional. Well, but then once you present a single case, you're called one conditional. That was what, that was what no, these are, these are general probabilities. The general ones you want to call conditional, the single case you want to call unconditional. unconditional. It seemed kind of, well, okay, I, it just seemed, seemed kind of um, unnecessary to make that. To make the distinction. To put those words in there. But see, that, I guess for me, maybe not for you, the, if you, if you start with the principal principle, you're talking about chances that are specifically introduced as single case objective probabilities. And then the question, and they play a role in a fundamental theory. The tendency in the discussion has been to reify them and take them as much fundamental. Part of what I'm doing is trying to give a much more general account of probability and then show how to extract something that has the right form um, to play that role in the, so it's very important that. So do, do, do chances change with time? Uh, I mean, I just, I, when I hear this peak, uh, principal principle we talked about, I took it that he was talking about the, the chance now, which would be conditional on the conditions now. So. Uh, no, the chances, so if Lewis is a bit, I mean, if you want to talk about Lewis, yeah. Lewis is a bit, um, uh, there are some places where he says conflicting things, but the, the canonical story. Chances are associated with events. Events are spatiotemporally located. They're single case, so they happen once. So each event happens once. It has a particular chance of happening. And it would have had, that same, and it would have had that same chance in the beginning of time. Yeah. No. That's how the list has chances. So remember, he actually has a little a metaphor of a maze, you know, the, your chance of getting out of the maze, which is a particular event, um, changes as you go through the maze depending on which way you turn. 
the ch so look at the principal principle. Right? You conditionalize on all of history in this version, and that defines what the chances are. For but you conditionalize right, on the all history so the far. Uh, the history up to a certain point. So here's what, here's a way to think of it. You tell me how Lewis thinks of it. You can't go both ways. I think so. You have to relativize the chance. So we're picking out some particular future event. And here's an agent. An agent can do one of two things. It can conditionalize on her his. She can conditionalize on her history or she can conditionalize on the history of the event that she's assigning chance to. It's a bit confusing about how to, and I don't, you know, I, I, I don't have any dog in this fight, but you can't have it both ways. You have to specify what you need. You can conditionalize, when, when you say that you're assigning the chances of some future event, you can think of, well, the chances evolve because I'm conditionalizing on my own history, and as I approach the chances, as, as, sorry, as, as you know, as, I, as my history grows, so to speak, as the point of view from which I'm assessing the chances changes, then the chances change. I think that's a bit confusing. It's a bit confusing because if you're thinking in a kind of relativistic sense, you ought to be thinking about, you know, nothing's really changing in that. Choose your point, choose the event to which you assign a probability, and, it, and, and you have, you know, a fixed number. So you relativize so I guess I'm just quibbling with the difference between relativize and condition. Yeah, I think so. Um, so think, so I think, mean, it's a single case yeah. relativized probability because it's relativized to that situation where the event Yes, is. yeah, exactly right. Okay. Okay, I've quibbled enough. <laughs> yeah, um, so but let me, I mean, I'm very, but let me say, so suppose you're thinking in, in relativistic terms, and the only thing I mean by relativistic terms is we're thinking in terms of a four-dimensional manifold. This is the event to which we're assigning the probability. This is the moment from which we're assigning the probability. Um, what, uh, if, oh, I see, okay, so I think the bottom speak, moment changes, yeah. the probability well, the bottom, changes. I mean, strictly speaking, nothing changes. This is a four-dimensional manifold. Yes, but so what happens but, but is that you, you, know how you to go to time. time. No, as, I do. As we have different, as we pick different uh, times. Right, uh, right, right, right. So in that way, the probability objective, the chance is indexed to a time. Right, and the, and the time to which it's indexed changes when you're saying what is now the chance. I just find sure. it confusing to speak of anything changing. It's a little bit more explicit to say, look, at any given moment, Right? The chance of some particular future event has a fixed chance. You go through life, you're always you're always assessing the chances relative to a different moment. Yes. But I thought you thought that it becomes trivial after the event. The chance, either the event happens or doesn't, then the chance is one or zero. Yes. But you think up. Well, again, that's relative to any time in its future. So choose any time a particular future event has a chance relative to that time. So relative to any time before it, it has a chance given by the total history up to the event, and relative to any time after it, it has a trivial chance. Yeah. Okay. You'll see, yeah. Is it, I think you're all right. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, the chances in the principal principle are subscripted to times t. Yeah. And of course, p sub t is invariant across the whole history of the manifold. But as t changes, the piece of T function changes, right. and that's the thing that Barry's talking about. You're just talking about the... Yeah, but the, the reason to get that right, I'm going to say this, I keep sort of like going in. The reason to get that right is because people, so when people talk about the principal principle, they usually just drop the subscripts. Right? Um, they drop the subscripts, and wait, what was I going to say? And it's important that by, in the way that chance is defined, time plays a really important role because it says, you know, you adopt the chances in pre, uh, as credence unless you have specific information from the future. I mean, actually what he talks about is sort of crystal balls and he waves his hands at, but when you try to transpose that into a physical context, what one ought to say, and in such a way that you can find a natural interpretation for the chances. Okay? What you want to say is, what sort of feature um, of the manifold would play the role such that if you knew what it was, it would trump all and only historical information. 
And that seems like just the probability condition along the entire past of the event. So it's sort of important to reintroduce those and speak in a way that you make the, the temporal indexing explicit. And then you can see why, why the epistemic role makes perfect sense. I, I think uh, my problem is just that I think that using this use of the words conditional and unconditional is kind of confusing uh, to anyone with my background. Yeah, that makes because sense. normally, uh, you know, we, we would just think unconditional would be something sort of like before you have any information, and then as you have more and more information, you would condition and condition. And your single case uh, um, uh, probabilities would sort of like be the ultimate conditional probability, condition on all the information there is in the world that could possibly be had. So it's the ultimate conditional probability. Yeah. Whereas the un what you're calling the conditional ones are the ones that, uh, in fact, uh, could be changed by conditioning on more information. The insurance company is not distinguishing uh, you know, have some class that knows that there's differentiation within that class, and that's not conditioning on that. So, you're saying exactly so, where I'm, what I want so to get. So you're kind of using the words in the opposite way that someone else, that someone coming out of statistics, say, would use them in the opposite way that you're using them to get across your point. Oh, but yeah. okay, so but, but let me sort of. So, so I'm, only, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only quibbling with the words, not with what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, but, but the words. There's a reason that I use single case unconditional because that's the form that's given to us by the principal principle, and that's the definition that's given us by Lewis. Um, quantitatively, and this is exactly what I'm going to say in a second, and quantitatively, the numbers that you fill in here are the ones that are exactly as you say, the ultimate conditional probabilities. So you have to find, you have for all of the sort of reference classes or conditional probabilities you can find, for this event here, which ones quantitatively are the ones that can play the, that epistemic role? I would say exactly that. That's what the chances are. They're a special case of conditional probability. And this works for quantum mechanics, because in the quantum case, that's what the chances are too. The probability of an event, or I like to put it in the way that I find natural to put, put it is information theoretic terms. Um, is the, informa is, is the, the probability the chance of some event, is it probability conditional <coughs> on its complete past history, or the information that it's passed contains about what, what um, so in quantum mechanics you're always thinking about sort of a measurement result. The information that the entire history of that particle contains about the results of that experiment. Or, I mean, if it's a Markov case, the, you know, any, uh, um, it, it, it state immediately before, so again, you know, you're. I think you're. You're sort of saying what I. You know, we're not saying anything different. Maybe the terminology is different. But again, part of that, you know, this is pushing the philosophical discussion in the direction of saying, look, what there is is statistical probabilities. You know, and um, and the the way that we've started to think about chance for various contingent historical reasons. One is quantum mechanics. But one is, you know, this sort of the history of this Lewisian discussion and the way it got wrapped up into kind of modal metaphysics um, has pushed us to think that there are these quantities, objective single case probabilities, that play a role at the fundamental level. Um, and that all these other probabilities, those were something much less mysterious that were stabilized out of ordinary dynamical interactions. But here's something new. And I'm trying to say, no, let's look in detail. First, let's identify, let, let's get clear on um, the difference between kind of, you know, what are informal terms, objective single case probabilities, and these things that we think of more, much more naturally in terms of conditional probabilities. So one, one reason we got into this, I think, is that because in quantum mechanics, the history doesn't make any difference for the most for the probabilities of quantum. You're interested in so that's mechanics. another interesting, right. So, well, that's why I said it's a Markov. In the Markov case, you can eliminate the past history, but you need to you need to see that and make it explicit to understand the Lewisian discussion. Because remember what Lewis said: it doesn't matter what historical information that that you have, you, so long as you don't have any future information, adopt that. All right, but just so that everything's on the table. So, but when he actually talks about the notion of probability, yeah. chance he's interested. In, he does think, as Isaac was saying, it's indexed to time, and it's indexed to the 
and so there's the probability at time t of some event at some later time occurring in such and such a way, and that probability then is different for different first. You know, I'm, I'm remembering this now. Right. So when I wrote about this, I'm the one that changed that. Right. Um, because for the reasons I said, you're absolutely we, I, right. Well, we definitely spent too much time talking about this. So it's like, it's yeah. Idea. yeah, no, but it is important. I mean, the, the whole tenor of what I'm saying is effectively, let's just sort out analytically, very explicitly, what we mean by chances. If you're going to be a Lewisian, then the first thing is you say, let's identify the things that Lewis meant by chances. They were objective single case probabilities. And let's situate them in a more complicated you know, matrix and look at the connections between them. And then let's take that whole matrix and try to relate that to patterns. That's how Lewis that. began. But I, my own view is that that was, I mean, probably your view too, from what you said, mm -hmm. said that was a mistake. So given what you said about being a Louisiana, I'm not one. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, should I just go on or should I just drop this? OK, I'm almost done, I think. But done? Um, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, but that's the general, I mean, that's the general view of all of this. I want to preserve that, you know, that beliefs about chance are something much more interesting than beliefs about local matters in particular, fact, patterns in the, in the human mosaic. They're, they're, they're the results of systematization, and they play a very particular epistemic role. They play the epistemic role of, exp actually, I'm going to go on. They play the epistemic role of guiding belief for creatures like us who have information about the past but not the future. So there's something like expert credences um, that are trumped by magical information about the future. It makes perfect sense in a quantum case that that's the role they're playing there too. Why should you believe in sort of these statistical probabilities? Well, for ordinary physics reasons. You know, the, the dynamics generate stabilized relative frequencies. We find them in the lab all over the place. We study these things. And then later on, we get the theory that tells us, and the theory, the, the dynamical underpinnings is often incredibly complicated, and it's different from case to case. We understand why these kinds of systems you know, tend to produce stabilized relative frequencies. Sometimes it's in, in, in under certain constraints. Sometimes it's self-organization. Sometimes it's, but those statistical probabilities are very often first in the order of discovery. The kind of detailed theoretical underpinnings are second. It doesn't depend on there being determinism. Um, we get indeterminism in an interesting case, but not in a case that introduces, you know, an, a new kind of ontological category. Okay, so I'm going to go on quickly and I'll run through the rest of it. We have lots of time. Do we? Yeah. No? Okay. Go to 8.30. <laughs> we'll never stop before 6.30. <laughs> we won't get to eat them. <laughs> so once we have, and this is what I, what I hope we're coming to agree on, once we have the general probabilities, and I'm actually, um, maybe we can talk after about whether this is not the right vocabulary at all. Um, it's vocabulary inherited, and it might uh, you know, not be the right vocabulary. But once we have the general probabilities, we can look to identify the single case unconditional probability of an event derived from the general probability that can play the role carved out, got in belief by the principal principle. And here we just look at what the principal principle says. It says, adopt chances as credences, no matter what information you have from the past, provided that you have no specific information from the future. So we look for the probabilities that will screen off all and only information from the past. There are two natural candidates. The first goes naturally with the Lewisian framework, in which uh, theories of chance. So in Lewis's framework, I don't know if you know this, Glenn, but chance, theories of chance take the form of history to chance conditionals. And the chance of E at T that is, is equal to the general probability. And so what I'm proposing here is, is a definition of chance in terms of history to chance conditionals. The chance of E at T is quantitatively, that's not the is of identity, the general probability of an event like E following from a pre-T history, where both E and pre-T history are characterized in intrinsic qualitative terms, categorical terms for Lewis. There are different ways that we might think about this quantity. So we might think of it as an expression of the information that history contains about E, or we might think of it as a measure of the propensity of pre-T histories 
to produce E. I don't care about the metaphysics that much. Um, or a second, which I think fits much more naturally with a physical setting in which we think of the intrinsic state of a system as determining the probabilities of events that fall in its future. In this case, we conditionalize not on all of history, but on the intrinsic state of the system in whose future E lies. So the chance of E for a system in state S is the general probability of an E type is quantitatively the general probability of an E-type event for a system whose intrinsic state is S. As above, we can think of this quantity either as an expression of the information that S's intrinsic state contains about whether or not E lies in its future, or as a measure of the propensity of a system in a state S to produce E. If we assume a Markov condition, that is, if the intrinsic character of a system screens off any information from its previous history, then one and two are quantitatively the same. Either of them will screen off historical information, but not information from the future, or in a relativistic setting, information that's not drawn from its absolute past, so including information from the absolute elsewhere. And so either of them will be suited to playing the role of chance in guiding credence. Um, so there are interesting connections between these two things. There's some really, from I guess a physics point of view, um, there's some really nice work in computational mechanics, for example, that shows that under quite weak assumptions, we can start with a set of observable quantities, divide histories into equivalence classes that generate the same conditional probabilities for the observables, and then use those to construct a Markov chain of what are now called causal states that screen off information from the past and generate the same conditional probabilities. And you can see that in quantum mechanics, those will be the quantum states. So what the causal states capture is all of the intrinsic structure in the system that's relevant to predicting the variables of interest. So there are lots of interesting things to say about the relationship between these two options. But in the special case in which the, the um, states are causal states in the sense that I just described, either of them will screen off all and only information from the past and so either of them will be well suited to play the role of chance in the principal principle. Okay. Finally, there are the credences, which are just subjective degrees of belief. And these are just descriptive of the epistemic states of believers. I mean, one of the other things that happens in this literature is people want to say, are the chances objective or are they not objective? And part of what I'm saying is that this is a complicated matrix in which you've got things that are more objective tied to things that are clearly subjective, and that there's no way of kind of compressing this matrix and getting a direct link between the chances and categorical facts. Okay. So what we have, then, are three logically distinct notions of probability. The general conditional probabilities, which we can link to stabilized relative frequencies and reference classes. The chances, which are inform the single case unconditional probabilities that guide belief in accordance with the principal principle. And then the credences. And we can say some things about the relationships among them. The relationship between the general conditional probabilities and the intrinsic state of the system to which they are assigned is metaphysically contingent in the sense that it's mediated by laws which relate the intrinsic state of the system to its future behavior. We can think of the categorical properties as bearers of, cha bearers of chance, at least in a world in which the present chance is pertaining to S a system as supervene on its intrinsic state. The connection between the general conditional probabilities and credences is likewise contingent, mediated in this case by facts about our epistemic situation. So you shouldn't accept the chances as credences if you regularly um, get information from the future. They're good guides to belief only for creatures, right? <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Could you explain the first contingency again? Why is that contingent? Which contingency? The first one. Relationship between general conditional probability and intrinsic state of the system. Why is it contingent? It's metaphysically contingent, not physically contingent, because it's mediated by the laws and that relate the system's present state to its future behavior. So the idea is that the chances contain information in probabilistic form about the future behavior of the system. And it's derived from saying, you know, systems in this state are related by law 
to future behavior of that kind. So when I say metaphysically contingent, I just mean we can imagine possible worlds in which these kinds of systems behave in a different way. I don't think it's controversial, but you seem skeptical. Uh, I just don't know what the words mean, metaphysically contingent. I'd love to understand. Okay. It just means you could imagine a world in which a system in exactly this state didn't have those probabilities. If the probabilities are a summary of information about um, its future behavior, expected future behavior. Um, the, uh, okay, so in sum, we have, I already said this, we have a matrix of probabilistic notions connected at one end to belief and at the other end to stabilized relative frequencies. Chance is linked to belief by the principal principle, and the general probabilities are linked to stabilized relative frequencies by the law of large numbers. The internal links among these elements in this matrix are uncontroversial. Most of them are definitions, except for the connection between chances and general probabilities. But I, I suggested that those are sort of constrained by the alignments of the other elements. So if chance is, is, is defined by the role of chance guiding belief, then the only general probability that makes sense to fill in for chance is, are the ones that I propose. General probabilities conditional on history, or on the intrinsic state of the system, more competition. Okay, so when chance is situated in this matrix, the closest connection that we get between chances and categorical facts comes from the link between chances and general probabil prob probabilities and stable, comes from the link between general probabilities and stabilized relative frequencies. This secures an evidential relationship between frequencies and probabilities, but it also blocks reduction because it leaves open the possibility that the actual frequencies may diverge as long as you like from the probabilities. So there's not a strict identity. And as I've said, I think that on this point, the human should concede that her account does not provide a reduction. The connection between probabilities and statistics interpret the probabilities without reducing them. Um, empirical content flows into this sort of matrix of probabilistic notions through the connection between statistical probabilities and stabilized relative frequencies. And to acknowledge that the that, that connection isn't tight enough to re permit reduction is not to commit one to a substantial anti-human ontology for chances. The human only needs to say that there's a difference between making statements about patterns in the human mosaic and the difference, a difference in the commitment that you acquire in making that statement and making a guess or venturing an inductive hypothesis based on those patterns. The human can hold that the chances are best guesses based on patterns in the human mosaic without holding that they have to be identified with those patterns. The difference here matters because if we're trying, and this is, the, this is how I'm half human, the difference matters because if we're trying to capture the content of beliefs about chance, then there are good reasons for denying that beliefs about chance are the same as beliefs about patterns in the human mosaic. They fail the modal test for sameness of content. We can hold fixed events in our imagination and imagine that the chance is varied, and vice versa. You call that a modal test? A modal test for sameness of content. It's a sort of standard, so, you know, patterns of argument in philosophy, if you want to show that, that beliefs of this kind have the same content of beliefs of that kind, you have to show that you can't conceive of a possible world in which you can hold fixed these facts in very detail. So the word modal, I wanted to ask at the beginning, what does modal mean? Oh, okay, sorry, uh, I should have said. Well, no, I, I, yeah. I mean, so I'm not... So modal up to date on philosophy, I guess. Modal means involving possibility or necessity. So Lewis believed, and this is in contrast with categorical. So categorical means involving no necessity or possibility. Modal means involving necessity. So or does the human have to believe in modality? The human thinks that modal statements have to be understood as identical to statements categorical statements. That's, that's what it means to reduce them. You have to show that anytime you've got a modal statement, it's really just a summary of ordinary categorical facts. That's one kind of union, but Janan's a different kind of union. I'm, I'm 
she sits at a half, but she's a whole Jungian with a different Jungian. <laughs> Good. Okay. A little bit in this ballpark. Um, so, in a way, this account of chance is more akin not to um, phenomenal concept strategy, but more like Gibbard about yeah. um, morality, because the belief about um, chance, you know, is more of a willingness to make certain kinds of inferences. So it's, uh, we account for states of mind involving chance. We don't think yes. of chance out in the world. And there's a, a parallel view with modals in general. So like, you know, uh, Simon Blackburn yep. uh, has this view, and I guess Price was this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. um, so are you thinking, so I was thinking this is most naturally situated paired with that kind of thought about modals in general. They're like inference tickets or something, and they're not really about anything out there. And I, I was thinking that um, you know if you you're, you know you're basically a realist. I don't know. That's like a if one is a realist in, in some really crude sense. You might be okay with having that kind of attitude towards the kinds of modals in the physical modalities. But, I, mean, I feel like one kind of person is thinking it's fine to have that attitude with respect to the modalities and the laws. Because you think, well, with the, the content of a law isn't, it is a law that or something. I mean, you want to be realist about the theoretical terms in the law, like charge and mass or whatever, but maybe not about the modality and its lawiness. Right. But in, if you have laws where their actual statement makes reference to chances, and you are anti realist in the sense about those chances, I feel like that's another, uh, a big step away from realism. You know, it's like you can you can think of charge as an inference ticket, and that's that's going much farther. So this is a little like that. So I, I wonder it whether there's like a that. sense in which you're, you know, so, you're, you're really got to be a kind of anti-realist about quantum mechanics, right? So yeah. that's why I don't like the words realism and anti-realism. Yeah. <laughs> this is what it is to accept statements about chance. You know, the person who wants to be a big R realist is kind of getting it wrong. That's what I want to say. I mean, to to say that I'm an anti-realist about chance. It suggests strongly that I don't believe in chances. Of course I do. I believe in, you know, I don't want to reify chances. Well, That's maybe, it. so I, I agree. You shouldn't, like, say, I shouldn't say well, this is word realist and then try to hit other people with it because yeah. who cares? But that seems right. Um, is it, is it, is it reducing the distance between this and, and instrumentalism about quantum mechanics? So good. Um, so is that, you know, that matter? Is, or is it, well, maybe I'm making a yeah, big word no, out of instrumentalism. Why do we care about that? Why do we not? Why do we, in general, so my general view is again. So I'm going to say something before I say my general view. The reason I focused on the case of chance is because to me it's important to understand in detail how particular classes of beliefs work. I care less about the semantics. To me, this seems about as realist. I don't want to see the idea that to be a realist you have to reify everything. I think that's sure. just wrong. But you're you're super. In, sort of seeing deeply into it, everything that you said is right. And it's sort of as a general view, though again, I'm going to say the general view has to be motivated in particular context, in, in particular cases, by a detailed look at how the, the, that class of beliefs works. So you know, to be a realist about cows is different from being a realist about chances. But about the, the modal quantities that are the output of theorizing that science gives us, chances, causes, dispositions, capacities, I want to say that they all belong to a class. Um, that I like this phrase so much. I hope I, I'm going to use it and give it to hope people. They're partially prepared solutions to frequently encountered problems. So for creatures like us in a world like ours, and I don't, you know, I'm going to say it, and I'm not. I don't know whether I'm a human about loss. Um, but but for a world that's like ours, right, for creatures like us we very often find ourselves in the position of trying to form expectations about future, future um, events about which we have no specific information. And that's what scientific theories do. They systematize the body of fact in a way that prepares the chances in advance for us so that we know that we can do no better than this. That, that, that's the sense in which they're experts. So I'd say that's the role that chances play. They're you know, partially prepared solutions to frequently encountered problems. Um, causes play a slightly different role. 
you know, causes have a little bit of extra modal content. Causes tell us something like what would happen to, you know, what, what, are the, what are the future, I mean, and this can all be made, again, you know, sort of analytically, you know, much more precise. But what about the causes? Well, we have to know what, this is how we know what causes are. We look carefully at the epistemic and practical role that causes play for creatures like us. The extra information that causes contain over and above chance is that they tell us the probability that w what interventions on a particular variable do to the probabilities of events that lie downstream of them. Why do we need those? Like why, why would those be partially prepared solutions to frequently encounter problems? Here's the problem. Very often we're in the, po in the position of intervening and we want to know what it, what's going to happen conditional on you know, an intervention of a certain kind. So that's the idea that you know, I, you're, you're absolutely right. For me, the modal commitments that come aren't descriptions. They're something like, you know, in, they're, they're, they're products of, of the inductive content we squeeze out of patterns of fact, how we use information about the categorical facts that we know to form expectations of various kinds that are embodied in these little things that you can call them inference tickets. But yeah, sure, I'm a total Brandomian about content. You know, the content of an expression is given um, partly by the inferential commitments that it bears to other, um, other, other elements in the you know, kind of network of concepts. What other you know, kind of inferentially licensed inferences that you can draw from it. Um, that the whole body of concepts has, uh, you know, links to the environment and also links to action. And there's not in general any reason or any way of compressing concept by concept the content into a direct link to something in the environment and to assume that the only role that it plays has nothing to do with guiding belief, nothing to yep. do with guiding, um, guiding action, but to to reflect some feature of the environment. I think that's the wrong picture of semantics. But I'm less interested in the semantics than I am interested in saying, let's just take a side on look at you know, how we form beliefs about probabilities and what they do for us. If you want to reify them in the, envir in the environment, you know, if you want to say what it is to believe about them, I see no reason to reify them. You know? um, and I think I'm a perfect realist. The world looks, you know, to, um, but I'm I'm happy to give that to you, uh, but um, but that's you know that's kind of the general tenor. Should I go on, or should we just talk? We should probably just talk. Yeah. We should go on then. We should what? Applaud. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So part of his, after that last discussion, Hume is going to turn out to be half human, but that's, but that's okay. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah that's uh, absolutely right. So, so this notion of content, because I felt like I understood everything except when the notions like epistemic and credence and, and, yeah. and content got, got used. So, and, and part of the difficulty is I just don't know how to factor out Lewis's own squirrely views about all of that. So, when you started talking about inference, when you started talking about start inference tickets, right? I got the picture when you mentioned brand. Okay, so we're gonna have this very, very heavily two-factored picture of content, um, where stuff that's going on in the inside is a crucial partial determinant. Um, but, but now, just if you say a little bit more about how that's gonna um, connect up with the idea that the chances, these things I'm having my beliefs about. It, these things that I'm having my beliefs about chances about. Good. Okay. They, they got to be somehow independent of my psychology. Good. For, for, and, and here's just like the really super boring reason I've got in mind. Um, what's the chances that I'm going to see Hesperus tomorrow, given that I'm going to see Hesperus tomorrow? Pretty darn good. What's the chances that I'm going to see Hesperus tomorrow, given that I'm going to see Phosphorus tomorrow? And you can feel like, oh, that's. That's like a, a sort of things up for grabs, right? right. So, now, I know what Lewis says about that. I don't believe it for a minute. But I just want to hear what, like, what you would say. Good, OK. So, so remember when I said chances are a normative form of epistemic probability. The right way to think of them are the credences of an expert who's kind of systematized the whole body of factor, or what we know of it, and delivered these sort of inductive recommendations. They embody expectations of the kind that this expert is giving you. Of course, the expert can be wrong. 
And of course, you can be wrong about it because they're supposed to guide belief rather than being descriptive of, of your expectations. So that's what I want to say about it. So if you run a kind of best systems on the level of an individual, the individual goes and looks at patterns and forms various best guesses, but we're not, we don't have much information, we're not that good at that. So you run the best system analysis, which actually delivers what we think of as the real normative form of projective probability. Let the whole community suss out what it takes, the best guesses, the best, most informed guesses for some future event to be. Those are going to be the chances. And so the relevant experts have knowledge of all the particular identities which are so it's a good question. So you know, there are two layers to this. One are what are the identities in the world, and the other is what are the identities in the theory. So the the theory can be wrong. The theory can be wrong because it allows the chances of two things that are in fact identical to vary independently. Um, so ultimately, of course, we want the chances to reflect all of the connections that there are in nature. But remember, chances are just deliverances of a theory, and the theory could be wrong. So I'll stop after this, but it feels like there's going to be a lot of these things that are going to be, it won't fall comfortably into just screening off the future, because in addition to all the particular, like Hesperus, Phosphorus, Woodchuck, Groundhog identities, yeah. now they're going to also all this sort of thing about like relations of ancestry, right? So if you're cryptian about these things, Right, you're going to have one sort of view about the chances of, of uh, uh, you know, mammal, human kind of things, and if you're losing a, a different one. And so part, part of now I'm thinking, like, because I really hope the experts don't have to have sorted out Lewis versus Kripke in order so, to make the assessments about what the theory says. But these are great, because the theory has a very articulated content. It comes with an ontology and a dynamics, and in the indeterministic case, and, and I agree with Barry, also in the deterministic case, tacitly or not, probabilities. Okay. Um, so the ontology is the part where you look, you you give the individuation conditions for various things. Right? So you say there there are these things, and there you do sort out what are the what are the independent elements that you might think of as the atomic constituents of nature. Um, and then on top of that, you've got the dynamics, which tells you how these things evolve. And then on top of that, you've got the probabilities. So a theory does, like it or not, make judgments about those kinds of things. They're made in a different part than um, the part about the, in the part of the theory that tells you what the chances are. If a theory tells you Hesperus is phosphorus, and, you get, and the chances, um, you know, it doesn't make use of that information in assigning chances to whether or not Hesperus is going to, then there's a problem with the theory. Anything. I want to go back to the three, the same notion of probability that you mentioned yeah. in one of the slides. Um, so first is the general probabilities, second is the chances, and third is credences. And um, before we need all of them, you know, theory of probability in terms of... Say that um, again, I'm sorry. We're probably need all, all three of them, yeah. on your view, yeah. uh, because we might need them to do guiding credences and um, that system and so on. But I was wondering whether we need the second one in addition to the first one even in the case of quantum mechanics. Chances, right. Uh, yeah. Right, so you might think that um, probability in quantum mechanics is given by the Bohr's rule, um, which is going to be an axiom in the bottom of um, theory of measurements, okay. which we know to be inconsistent and ejected only. So we want to solve the measurement problem first and see what follows from those solutions, like GFW and Bohr, and maybe Everett. And you solve the measurement problem uh, a la Bohr and GFW, then we realize the Bohr rule is not going to be a fundamental postulate. It's going to follow from simple analysis based on the laws, which can be stochastic or deterministic. And those analyses are going to make use of typicality measures, yeah. which will be very coarse grained, and it can give you lots and lots of information without giving you some kind of single case probabilities, for example. So it seems to me that um, even in quantum mechanics, we don't need chances for realist theories. And if that's the case, then it seems to be one less worry, one fewer worry about the reduction. Um, yes and no. So um, no in the sense that in that case, um, that I would say there are still chances, but they're all zero or one. I'm not. The chance of every, every, every event conditional on is raising is zero or one. But I can just specify the theory without giving any yeah, I agree, I agree, but, but you can derive the chances 
from what the theory tells you. Um, but the that would be theory. not very useful in terms of how. I agree, yeah, uh, completely right. agree. So we can, we can have a theory, a best system for Bohm and GFW. There was nothing in the definition of chance right. that said that there are non trivial fundamental okay. chances. Absolutely. Well, GRW would be true. Yeah, they would in, yeah, in, hmm. yeah. So I'm thinking about GRW in case that um, you clear up the maximum problem, you have a stochastic term in the uh, uh, equation for wave functions, and um, that can be thought of as just the, uh, one of the variables we use to get typicality measure or trajectory of wave functions. We don't have to think of it as a genuine. Who cares chance. about a typicality measure? You've got the the probability of the wave well, function of I think that is what will be the important thing to generate physical analysis. So stochastic dynamics themselves, you analyze the frequencies, the frequencies in terms of how the dynamics generates probabilities. It's not just by cosmic and Delphi term in the dynamic that you can extract uh, information of frequencies. We maybe think about it differently, but the dynamics, the GRW will specify the probabilities of various evolutions of the wave function. That's one way to think about it. Suggest a different way. Right, and that would give that would give what Lewis and Janet were calling chances. In the in the Ohm theory, you don't get Lewis chances, but you do get you know there's a maximum amount of information that you can have about um, the uh, uh, the wave function and the, and the particle positions, and conditional on that, that's the maximum you can have. That that would play with anything more than that. Would play something like the role of information from the future. Yeah, I agree. That's one way to think about the p term in the theories. So it's a different way of thinking about typicality as a notion that's being summarized um, in the best system. So typicality is summarized as the probability here. You can think of the probability ball measured up on a par as typicality measures or trajectories of wave Let's talk about typicality next Wednesday. What's up? <laughs> talk about it on Wednesday. Yeah.